Welcome back to Haunted and Historic Australia. Today's episode, we are looking at the history of Minchinbury Winery. Minchinbury is located approximately 40 kilometres west of the Sydney CBD. Named after Captain William Minchin, who was granted a thousand acres after his retirement back in 1819, Governor Lachlan Macquarie granted him this land. Captain William Minchin was the Principal Superintendent of Police and Treasurer of the Police Fund in the colony. He didn't have this property long before dying in 1821 and its use at the time was primarily for grazing cattle. After William passed away, he passed the property on to his daughter Maria Matilda. However, she doesn't have the property very long before she and her family are lost at sea this leaving no descendants of William Minchin alive to take over the property. He did, however, have a brother named George, who was in Canada at the time. He inherited the property and went on to sell it. So far, it's pretty sad, this story. Um, a little bit more on Maria Matilda. She was the only daughter born to William and Anne Minchin, and she was actually born at sea on the way over to New South Wales. Maria Matilda was only 16 when she married a Henry Howie in Parramatta. Henry was a wealthy pioneer arriving in Australia in the March of 1826 and it wouldn't have been long before he was in the same circles as the Minchins and introduced to daughter Maria Matilda. The couple went on to have six children, the first being Anne, actually born at the Minchinbury estate. Shortly after Anne was born, they moved to another location near the Wallandilly River and they had five more children. Now, it is understood that Henry wanted to acquire more land, that after John Batman had purchased property down near Port Phillip, this piqued Henry's interest into acquiring more land down in the Melbourne area. As a result, he purchases more land in the Mount Macedon area. He organises various trips to get his cattle and sheep down there. And lastly, he takes a trip aboard the schooner Sarah with the family, a couple of other people as well as their servants, down to where he wanted to now settle. But on the trip, we know it didn't go as planned, that the boat had come into contact with land and as a result was wrecked. There's also various accounts as to what happened next. Despite them saying that Maria Matilda was lost at sea, there are versions of a story that suggest that a woman were taken in by the first people down in Victoria. As much of the land wasn't really inhabited by anyone but the first people, there would have only been the first people to rely on as there weren't any other settlers in this area. So the version goes that there was a white woman living among the first people with many children of both first people and settler. This caused a bit of a manhunt or woman hunt and many of the Kurnai first people were killed in this hunt for this white woman, fearing that perhaps Maria Matilda or one of the others on board of the 26 souls may have been taken by the first people and were held hostage. I seem to think that the first people were most likely helping them survive and possibly like William Buckley's story, Ma Maria Matilda or whoever it was that had survived the wreck was now integrating with the first people for survival. But you know what these settlers were like. Shoot first, ask questions later. So unfortunately, the mystery still remains. They never did catch up with whoever had the white woman. There is an Aboriginal song that may hold the key to what happened to the white woman. An anthropologist by the name of Howard noted down a version of this song in his notebooks, most likely translated from the Kurnai tribe. The words... Give the white woman from over the sea the possum skin skirt and that blanket there. It's what it's loosely translated as. And then there was another one, burn ladder and white fellow. 
The second part of this song or separate song was the white fellow's ladder is burning, telling the story of how they found the white woman. Apparently, from what Howard has been able to ascertain, she had been saved where some men had been, the lives of the men were lost. It could have been Maria Matilde, one of the servants, or her daughter, but it is thought that it was most likely someone aboard the Sarah. After the ordeal of Maria Matilda and her family, George Minchin sold the property in 1860 to a Dr. Charles Mackay. Mackay and his family established a vineyard on this area. And by 1879, the wines from Minchinbury received three awards at the Garden Palace in Sydney. However, for some reason, this isn't making Mackay any money. And in 1881, Mackay lists the property for sale again. We find that there's an advertisement by Charles Moore and Co. Auctioneers for this sale. It read, 600 acres in various sizes could be sold in sections if desirable. Minchinbury embraces 60 acres of enclosed land and planted with about 50,000 vines in full bearing. A trap dike of blue metal runs through Minchinbury from west to east, which will be invaluable to parties contracting for blue metal for Sydney streets. There is also a hill of trap tuff, the deposit from an extinct volcano. This is hard and durable stone used for some years on a portion of the Great Western Road. A tramway could be inexpensively made from the quarries to Rudy Hill Station. Fine clay for making bricks and good building sandstone can also be obtained. There are three wine cellars, 260 feet by 20 on 60 by 30, capable of storing 100,000 gallons of wine and wells, tanks and lagoons and never failing water supply. Despite the property being so lucrative, it didn't sell for another 14 years and it was sold to a James Angus and there's a story that goes along with James Angus too. There's a story that goes along with everybody in these episodes. Now, James Angus expanded the property. He established a quarry, a piggery, a dairy and olive trees onto the land. Now this must have been booming, but he then sells the property in 1913. It was sold to Penfold's Wines. James Angus retained a major portion of the estate for his family. But then in 1916, it's found that James is hit and killed by a train at Rudy Hill Station. So, so far, it almost seems as though it's a bit of a curse to have this land. William Minchin dies a couple of years after owning it. His daughter dies lost at sea with her family leaving no heirs in Australia. George Minchin, the brother of William Minchin, doesn't even set foot in Australia and sells it on from Canada and keeps his life by the sound of it. Mackay buys the property but finds himself in financial ruin and sells it. And now James Angus purchases the property and after selling a portion of it, dies a couple of years later, being hit by a train. It doesn't sound like a lucky estate when you think about it, but Penfolds do pretty well with it. Becoming the largest wine producer in the British Empire out of Australia, Minchbury was Penfolds' first venture into sparkling wines and it became famous for its champagne. In 1955, Penfolds obtained the original CAC Avon Sabre jet aircraft, which they installed at the entrance of the winery. They had it mounted about 10 metres off the ground, nose down, with a sign also saying, don't crash, drink Penfolds. That plane has been replaced, but it is actually still in Minchinbury at the moment. Amongst all the death that seemed to surround the Minchinbury winery, there was also a couple of near misses. The Newcastle Sun newspaper for Monday 29th of January 1940 says, Pedestrian injured, Sydney. Monday, Miss Florence Bernier, 50, wife of the manager of Penfold's Minchinbury Vineyards, Rooty Hill, was knocked down by a motor car as she was crossing Western Road. 
black town. She was taken to the Parramatta Hospital, suffering from concussion, a fractured collarbone and probably fractured ribs. It is not said that she died, so she must have recovered from these injuries. And not just this, but a young boy who lived in a cottage on the estate while his father was a winemaker at the Minchinbury Winery, spent his first 13 years growing up on the property. When the boy and his father were hunting Indian miners and starling birds which were eating the grapes, the father almost shot the son. The boy, feeling the pellets go past his head as he noticed ahead of him the water tower is showered with them, turns around to see his father in shock that he'd accidentally touched the trigger while raising the gun to aim at a bird. A few centimetres lower, he says, and he would have blown his head off. Not too long after this, his father's health went bad and he ended up with bowel cancer. He succumbed to this shortly after. The boy grown now says had his father not succumbed to the illness and the memories there, he probably would have gone into winemaking. The curse also came in the form of fire. The first fire breaking out in 1945, but not doing as much damage as it could have done. However, after Penfold sold the winery, this time in 1987, police believe children may have been responsible for a massive fire that was set inside the winery and basically gutted out the place. It was a shame as they were only just starting to build houses around that heritage listed area. It is believed that when Penfold sold the winery in 1978, it kind of went into a bit of a dilapidated state. For years it was abandoned and may even have been the site of an awful murder of a young woman back in 1988. We decided that the Penfolds or Minchinbury wineries was the best place to start having a little look around at some of Australia's history. And with all of this mayhem that surrounded the wineries, we thought we'd investigate a little closer. Initially, just to see the property, and maybe in a later episode, possibly try and reach out to the previous owners. We hope you enjoy. So this, we're standing on the Great Western Highway, which was once known as the Western Road. And this was the entry point to the the Minchinberry Winery, which uh, which was known as the Minchinberry Winery uh, up until 1913, uh, the winery giant um, Penfolds uh, bought them out, bought the company out, and hence its name over there. It was known from 1913 to 1978 as the Minchinberry Penfolds Winery. Uh, Penfolds has um, gone on to become, and was at the time, one of the premier uh, wine producers in the country and and the world and um, and this point here where that sign is and coming up here was the entry point off of as I say the what was known as the Western Road which is now the Great Western Highway um, and this used to be the point where they would bring you would be brought down to the homestead and to the uh, to the winery itself, and the whole area, which you'll see in this video, was um, was basically vineyard um, all around here, all where all the houses are on uh, on my left and my right were all all vineyards, and they were and they used to produce champagne, which was still known um, uh, at that point but it's sparkling wine which was something that was exported worldwide uh, and and uh, it was award-winning um, in Europe and I believe even uh, even was uh, popular in in France um, and the information that I've got but this area here uh, so this was the entry point as I say which is which is now known as the Kalamata Grove um, walkway and this point was where you would make your way down to the homestead. So we're gonna go for a walk down here and, and we'll show you. And the Kalamata olive trees that are actually, uh, that's still here today, 
they line line the whole the whole way down um, until you get to the the homestead now which is as you'll see is um, known is also is become um, uh, home units and, and and it's 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 a tribute but it's a shame that it's it was a tribute that was sort of lacking a little bit uh, today and it's only less than 10 years old so now we make our way over to the actual driveway uh, the original driveway that takes you down to uh, where the old homestead was and the actual the point where the you know all the all the grapes that were picked uh, were sorted and uh, and they were also there was this, well I guess it was a still um, with, that's something we don't actually know we're gonna have to find that out but we'll certainly pop it up on the screen so nobody picks us on it but it was where it was where it was the winery's uh, production point and like I said it was something that was open back in the day uh, and and it was it was something that was for this whole district um, an important uh, it was an important point and, and I believe it was something that was considered um, you know it was con from what they were producing the quality of the fruit they were producing and also the the, the wine making skill you know it was considered a success from very early on such a success that Penfolds um, even back in uh, the early 1900s were were pretty well you know they were at the pinnacle of the of the industry in this country um, and they had uh, they had the ability to, to buy up any any other smaller winery they could have but they chose they chose the Missionberry one um, because of the quality and the and the basically well the, the what the actual producer the fruit they were producing was as such that it was um, you know it was considered uh, worthy of awards around the world. So that was in 1913, as I mentioned. Uh, Penfolds have taken over, and they've continued the success. Um, and then by by the time 1978 rolled around there were a lot more I guess there was a lot more competition and this particular area was um, beginning to become uh, well it had already become a place that uh, lower socio-economic uh, groups of people and families had to move further and further away from the city uh, out to the western suburbs and the, the you know the whole production of the winery had to be moved really to um to continue their success so it was from 1913 to 1978 they closed it up uh and then as it always is the way uh with, unfortunately in some of these situations the, the winery the all the sheds all all the things that made up the winery were left basically to ruin um, and they were vandalized and so that that went on for about 20 uh, approximately 20 25 years afterwards um, and there was buyers and there was you know just general general disrepair of everything um, until they knocked it down and then it took another decade or so before they from what you'll see they've um, went ahead and utilized the area and tried to incorporate some of the winery's uh, uh, machinery um, there's a there's a chimney flute and there's also certain little bits and pieces and information that you'll see that they've tried to uh, leave a tribute to and and this this is where we are today but these trees here these Kalamata olive trees uh, have been here and this has been the entry point this was the entry point and they've left it as a tribute 
to this day they built houses on each side and left this through fair um, just as a nod to the to the industry and to what put Minchinbury on the map um, which is something which is nice enough you know I guess it was it wasn't necessary uh, but they've they believed that it was you know, whoever was in charge believed that it was a, a tribute that was worthy and I, I think they were right so this is like I said this is the driveway that would have been taking this is back way back in the 1800s and right up until the last bottle was ever produced in 78 and uh, and it's the walkway and uh, this is the Minchinberry the Penfolds Minchinberry winery driveway the estate and to the winery itself that still survives today Kalamata trees and all Trendy. Mm. Yeah, something that was going to be kind of like nice. There's a, you know, across the road from Mount Druid, but really it's, you know, it's low socioeconomic, really. The beehive will. some of these in the ruins mm. and they managed to repropagate them. It doesn't look like they look after them that well. I mean they're alive but um, you know. Possibly the time of year as well. Could be. Maybe because it's getting into autumn or it's in autumn. What's that? Of still building. Mm. But, um, but they had they had plans for this place, and now that this this wood fired oven pizza and uh, bar has obviously gone under, um, mm. it's kind of left a bit of a bit of a stain on the place. It's probably because of COVID. Well, it might be because of that, or it might actually be because they were just overpriced, and the people around here seemingly. Can't afford it. Well, yeah, they've got probably they pay. You know, they're not wealthy people. Mm. Um, but it would have been a selling point uh, for this place, and it would have meant that they could have kept the prices up mm. on the place they, for rent or for sale, um, because that would have been a, a, a reason. Hey, we've got this, blah blah blah. But now that that's left the ruin, the prices would have come down. And as you could see over there before, there's, there's rubbish, and they've just dumped rubbish inside inside the place and all in the corners, there's just bits and pieces that people have just chucked out. It's like, it gives you the impression that, you know what? It's a dump. It's going to end up as just a ghetto. Yeah. You know, or just about, probably in, in a very short time from now, it started already, I believe. Mm. There's a, um, there's somewhere, like, you know, somewhere nice, trendy almost, you know? Mm. What's that? It left like, have a look in there. Well, I must be able to just, you just walk through, you know? Mm. Um, I'll have to go back around. I don't think we can get in there, but, you know, I, I mean, we'll have a look. Thank you. 
somebody brought up the velocity of the ground to the lead in two. That's the pizza shop over here. There. See what I mean? If you look up there, but inside, can you see through there? Oh yeah, just wow. Hmm. I wonder if that was the original door. I wonder if that was the original door. Trying to get the sign. The old brick over there. The lion, sorry, Dal. I'll just grab pictures of these things here. J A and S or something. John Argus. Oh yeah, John oh. Argus. And, and son. son. Sorry, Sorry Dom. <laughs> It just doesn't go anywhere.
I'm going to walk up here and see what we got. What's that sign say? Aussie made.